So, hello everybody. So, um, I call this talk the art of calling methods. It's a bit high pitched. Uh, I, I will talk only about the art of how we call methods, not about real art and just about some handiwork we do with Groovy. Uh, just about me a bit. Uh, I'm on the mailing list usually called Black Track. Um, I work for VMware and I work on a Groovy project for quite a while now. And uh, if you want to contact me, it's the email address blackrack at gmix.org. I use that for, it's company independent, that's of uh, very much use if you change employer every year. <laughs> yeah, it happens if, if you do, if you work on uh, bleeding edge technology, then you may have to change your employer a lot. <laughs> So the all well-known Fibonacci, you know that very much now. You have seen it several times. Well, in, in Groovy, um, we can. Um, but the code you see here is actually Groovy code. It looks very similar to Java, though you may be missing the semicolons here. Uh, different to Java is uh, that the uh, mathematics operations here. Uh, almost all uh, method invocations. And uh, Groovy is a dynamic typed language, which means uh, we don't do the normal method calls that Java would do. Maybe, well, if, we, if it were Java, we wouldn't do the method calls at all. Um, instead, it goes through a meta class where we select our method, a bit like, well, I, I, I won't say small talk, <coughs> um, but there are similarities. I'm uh, talking a bit about the implementation technologies you could use. And um, what I will not talk about is something that takes a runtime AST to optimize this code to something. Because Groovy is a compiled language, it produces bytecode. And uh, our problem is we have to do something with that bytecode and that should be fast, maybe, hopefully, or not. And sometimes you cannot do anything. So the first technique I'm talking about is what I call the central invoker. I'm pretty sure there's a real name for that. Uh, I came up with this one only. Um, you will recognize this kind of style, I'm pretty sure. What you see here is this, uh, this transformation, transformed version of the bytecode that would be produced by Groovy 1 in 1.5. And what you basically have is you have this uh, script bytecode adapter, which is our interface between the runtime and the bytecode, and it calls a method, invoke method n, n because it takes an <coughs> arbitrary number of arguments as an object array. So then you see here, your method calls with, uh, for minus, for the fib calls, for the plus operation, and you see some unnasty, uh, well, very nasty unboxing method down there as well. This is uh, such uh, style is, uh, well, quite easy to implement. The problem is uh, what comes after you pass the bytecode level and you are now in your runtime, you have to do something with those. The problem is you may have uh, methods that are supposed to handle several, several cases. Y you know you have you, you can choose between usually either you do specialized methods that handle small cases or you do big methods that handle many cases. And if you're implementing uh, something on the bytecode level, which is interfacing, then usually you have the problem of compatibility with, uh, with uh, previous versions, uh, but you want to add new things or you have to add something because you forgot it. And then your method, they, gr they grow and grow and do handle more and more. You, then you start having instance of checks in those methods and they are not small at all anymore. Uh, you may end up with something like this, very special casing for each and every case that is thinkable. And, well, this is bad. So this kind of technique is 
as on a, on a pro side, it's, it's quite easy to implement. Uh, you don't have to generate very uh, difficult bytecode. It's, it's, it's uh, pretty straightforward. You have your few interfacing methods, you implement them somehow, and usually it works. Changes can be made easily, mo almost, and depending on uh, how general your methods have been. Um, the problem is if you have those invoke and methods, you end usually up with some megamorphic call sites somewhere in the, in the line. Those methods, they are too big, and with too big, I don't mean only the code size. I mean also for the, for the hotspot, it's too big to inline something there. And, and because uh, you don't do special casing for primitives, you also end up with a lot of boxing. So if you're going this approach, then maybe you should think about making an AST and uh, optimized an AST. Uh, that's not, I, I would say it's not as easy maybe uh, as this approach, but it's probably better performing better. You, you can go crazy with a lot of things and I cannot advise using that one. And then um, I come up, but well not I came up with it, it was actually uh, another guy, and he implemented what I call custom call site caching. Mm. Uh, meaning instead of using uh, the call sites that Java provides, uh, which before 1.7 we hadn't any influence over at all, uh, we provide some call site caching technique. And I know there are lots of ways to do call site caching, I won't talk about the lots of ways. There are several papers I suggest you read them. <laughs> and uh, we talk only about a very simple version of those that uh, Groovy uses. And uh, the uh, reworked bytecode Groovy produced in 1.6 and 1.7 looks then a bit like this. And basically, you have a call site array and this it's, it's backing, uh, it's a front end to a real array of core sites and we do some replacements in there depending on what we need. And this is um, a bit more difficult to implement, uh, a lot more easy to make bugs and uh, a bit faster too. So if, if you're uh, if your uh, target is speed, then this is an improvement to the approach before. Though, if, if you go with the AST runtime, I'm not sure uh, you're faster this way. In some, it depends on the case. And basically, it works a bit like uh, Invoke Dynamic. Uh, you have some general call site handle, uh, which is a bit like a bootstrap method uh, that will be used to replace itself in the call site to use a specialized version. The advantage is um, you have a quite general infrastructure and you can add uh, call site objects that are uh, specialized, containing fast paths more or less, and uh, it helps a lot. Um, I noticed that uh, Java can inline those sometimes. Um, the problem with the groovy call site caching that we use is that uh, uh, in the end there's somewhere a call to, uh, I would say, a volatile, which uh, is uh, uh, a dead end for the hotspot. And uh, then there will be no inlining in most cases. Only in those cases where the path with the volatile is not taking, there's a small chance it will be done. But even then, not always. But our primary goal was actually not so much uh, to, to do some fancy call site caching. Our primary goal was, and this was uh, before 1.6, uh, to replace reflection. Because reflection back then was so ugly slow, and we never got in the cases where runtime generated glasses uh, were be used especially not in 1.4 uh, versions that were be used and uh, that has been used to execute Groovy. And back then Groovy could also run on versions before 1.4. So uh, for our support for older VMs was 
uh, okay, uh, but reflection was not okay, you end up with very slow speed and that we didn't like. Cosite caching in our case did bring about a six time improvements or uh, six time improvements of the uh, speed. So method calls, well not method calls, code done uh, in uh, 600 milliseconds before were now done in 100 milliseconds, which is, that's a nice improvement. And that even though there was uh, mostly no inlining happening be, uh, at the, uh, beyond the call sites. So if, if you want to know more about those, uh, about call site caching in general, I, I really suggest you read the papers uh, that are out there. You, you find a lot about polymorphic inline caching and, and uh, look up tables and all that. You, you can do a lot of crazy things there. Uh, our call site caching is quite basic. We didn't go too crazy there. Uh, one reason for we not doing that is because the guy who impl implemented that produced uh, uh, 30 classes plus to implement this with lots of special casing, uh, which is uh, maintenance hell for us because, uh, well, not only half of the people that care about this code understand that code. <laughs> and uh, so there were also bugs in there we found. Uh, and some are really, really difficult to fix because actually one bug would require having two call site arrays and that's uh, conceptually difficult to make with the, uh, with the compiler infrastructure we have and the uh, logic that was built in would have required a total rebuild of, of uh, how it was done. Well, and if you generate classes at runtime, at least if you don't use the anonymous class uh, loading thing from 1.7, um, you have sometimes a garbage collection problem. Um, some VMs, I think of the IBM VM with uh, not the uh, uh, normal com uh, command line options. Options doesn't seem to like, for example, uh, um, soft referenced classes. It seems to assume a soft reference class is a hard reference class doesn't throw them away at all. Our call sites were soft referenced. Uh, the, I mean, the generated code behind them is uh, soft referenced. So we ran into memory issues unless we someone found then someone found a special command line switch uh, that uh, saved us. But um, and if if you are aware of uh, the garbage collection, then you know there are cases, for example, where where you write full the memory you can use for classes, uh, but you don't have yet written full the memory that is normally used and garbage collection things, uh, there's no need to run and uh, doesn't collect the classes that are obsolete even though there are a lot and then you get an out of memory error even though there was memory. Happens. Another issue with this kind of style is uh, threading usually. Uh, those core sites, they are maybe visited from many uh, threads at the same time. So you have to do some thread safe structures there, which is also the reason why we had that volatile in there, which uh, is uh, the hotspot dev here, kind of. And um, so it is an improvement, but it didn't bring us uh, anywhere near Java. I mean, not that we want to compete with Java. Java is, has its own right and all, uh, of course, and uh, we, we don't ever think of getting really near Java, but um, not being like uh, 30 times slower than Java would be nice, <laughs> of course. So uh, I came up, um, I, I hinted this technique, the primitive optimizations, uh, two years ago on the summit. Um, last year I implemented that and the idea of uh, the one I call primitive optimizations is that you compile in a fast path uh, and a slow path, of course. The fast path is guarded by some, uh, by some booleans actually only. I'm, I'm using I'm stretching the Java memory model in this one quite a lot because uh, they are really only unsynchronized booleans, so uh, 
it can happen that uh, there has been a change and uh, one thread sees the change, another thread will not see the change. But um, we decided to change the semantics of the language that this one is okay. That's the advantage if you do your own language independent of uh, uh, everyone else, uh, where you don't have to comply to some uh, Ruby standard, for example, or Smalltalk standard, I don't know, uh, or Dart. <laughs> I don't know if the problems are there similar. Um, if you do your own language, you can really just uh, do small modifications. As long as the users are not bothered too much by it, it's usually okay. And if it can give you a lot of runtime improvement, they are usually happy and uh, agree with the change. So uh, the basic idea, as I said, is uh, to have a block. It's important to have a block. It, uh, single expressions don't make sense because testing a guard costs. So you have to have a block of uh, expressions or statements. And the bigger, the better, because bigger means less Boolean checks. And uh, the, the Booleans are there to ensure the call is valid. And if it's valid, you uh, dive into your uh, optimized block and you do, for example, uh, I minus I calls, I add calls there, just what Java C would produce. And in this case here, I don't know if you can see the colors, but the n minus 1, the n minus 2, and the uh, plus, that's all done in uh, uh, Java C style integer math. And the calls to FIP in red here, they're direct method calls. So if you compare the code that is written in this fast path part, it's uh, really the same that Java C would produce. And who worked with uh, Hotspot before noticed surely that uh, you can code, you can produce code that is not optimized at all. It doesn't matter as long as it looks like what Java C produces, because that those are the patterns uh, the Hotspot will recognize and optimize. So we have the JIT here. Uh, that can just, in, in the best case, can just throw away the slow path and look only at the, uh, at the uh, fast path. Of course, it cannot throw away the Boolean checks because they're needed for the optimization and going to the slow path. Um, but if you do such a simple benchmark, they, uh, it, the optimization never happens, of course. So uh, if you do a real-world application, uh, you may have a quite different runtime behavior than uh, what you see in a micro benchmark. But that's a micro benchmark, and who knows about micro benchmark knows uh, you shouldn't do micro benchmarking in the first place, actually. And second, uh, it doesn't say anything at all about your application later. Micro benchmarking is actually just for managers and people that want to compare languages on a level that they are not supposed to be compared to. Uh, still, you just then get bloggers that rant about how slow your language is uh, if, if you don't care about micro benchmarks. Well, that's the problem if your language becomes popular. Uh, another problem uh, we have in Groovy is uh, the meta class system because the meta classes we generate, they are objects and they, are, they have to live sometimes as long as the class lives. With JDK7 and class value, there's a solution for this problem. Uh, but in uh, Groovy, there are cases in which we have to, in which we, in which we can do soft referenced meta classes, which mean they live until memory is not enough anymore, um, which is uh, not optimal. And in some cases, we have uh, everlasting meta classes, which is even less optimal because uh, uh, it takes memory, and even though even if you reduce the amount of memory used by those, it means it, they take memory. And uh, if and if you have a bigger application, you run it, you get to the point where there's no memory anymore, and then people start complaining because they see. Uh, in, in uh, memory management tools, for example, that there's so much meta class stuff. Why is Groovy taking so much uh, memory and all that? So uh, for the fast path case, uh, 
Um, here, we don't need the integer meta class at all. Something you avoid is the best optimization in general. So in the best case, um, we have some better memory behavior here as well. Uh, the fruits of this work is that this Fibonacci with the primitive optimizations runs at about 50% of Java speed, which is coming from Groovy 1 with 30 times of Java to now two times of Java. That's, that's a nice improvement. That's more, the goal for primitive optimizations was to come in reach of 10 times Java. And uh, so <coughs> that goal has been reached and I was very happy about that. Of course, there are negative sides um, to this and this, for example, the code size you produce, the byte code size is much bigger. Uh, even if Hotspot is maybe not bothered by it by throwing away uh, the slow path in a, f in, in a very early stage, it means uh, you hit the uh, bytecode limit of a method earlier, meaning uh, you, you allow only smaller methods than before. And somebody uh, that was using a method uh, that used the maximum amount before, uh, this method will not compile anymore uh, or in our case, actually fail with a verify error um, at runtime, and uh, that's a small disadvantage. Also, uh, you depend on uh, being able to infer the type somehow or propagate the types. Um, this is a dynamic language. Groovy allows you to use type annotations on the variables, but it doesn't require it. So if you do the Fibonacci example from before without all the int markers, uh, then uh, you won't have primitive integers, you won't have the speed of primitive integers. Uh, <coughs> and then, of course, it's not as fast as a primitive integer version. And the last point I mentioned already about micro benchmarks, uh, good for managers, uh, and not of any uh, real advantage in uh, bigger applications. Though um, we noticed that uh, some applications really profit from it a little bit, mainly because of the direct method calls this one enables. And so uh, you get a tiny, even in, in bigger applications, you get a tiny improvement. Um, if you have uh, mostly internal calls, then it's, it's very fast, but usually you call outside a lot. So, and, and we don't optimize those because it's difficult to check the meta class without generating a meta class or, or requesting one. Then uh, you don't get the advantage there. And there are many cases uh, where those primitive optimizations are disabled. I mean, um, in Groovy, uh, in Groovy 3, we will probably change that. But in uh, Groovy, you can create custom meta classes. Uh, they just have to buy uh, some interface. Um, the problem is you won't know what happens in those custom meta classes at all so much. You don't know, can I still cache my method? Is it allowed to or not? Because and there is uh, still the ye old uh, version of method calls from Groovy1 uh, that is uh, that the uh, bytecode interface gets the meta class and invokes the method using the meta class. And this means if you are not, uh, if you cannot cache because you don't know what meta class it is, you have to go through the meta class. You have again your central invoker. Uh, you, you cannot do any of your specialized call sites and you end up in hell as in Groovy1. Plus more complicated code, of course. And um, that's uh, also not nice. So that we are going to change semantics uh, in this one, especially the meta class AP API will change in Groovy3 a lot. And uh, Groovy uses mostly uh, one class called meta class implementation, which is the default meta class. It's a meta class that doesn't allow you to add any methods or remove them. So it's, it's really only a helper 
And um, it's, it's very nice if you don't have to care about edit or remove methods. Uh, you can simplify your code quite a bit. And this is our favorite one, of course, and that's the default one. And uh, the problem is if you go, for example, to Xpinda meta class, which allows removal and addition, it still allows for caching. Um, but you cannot easily anymore say, oh, has uh, integer plus removed, uh, replaced, or whatever. And, in, and then you cannot do primitive optimizations anymore. And now, unfortunately, expand meta class is the default meta class, for example, for Grails, which is a, a web framework uh, for Groovy, uh, similar to Rails. You notice the similar name, which is not intended, of course. I have to say that for legal reasons. Um, <coughs> but that's not all. Uh, for example, on Google App Engine, there's uh, Guillaume's project called Gaelic. Uh, he, uh, it's a web framework for Google App Engine, and he uses categories very much. Uh, categories in Groovy, that's, uh, you can imagine it's like um, adding methods to a class in a limited scope in a current thread. And um, in the current thread, that's exactly why we had that volatile stuff before, because we had to do some thread checking and, ah oh well, if the uh, result for primitive optimizations, the, the uh, I should say the easy decision path uh, for primitive optimizations was, if a category is active, uh, disable primitive optimizations. Cause I Cosite caching uh, can handle uh, categories a bit better, but uh, not very much, actually. Um, I will show you some numbers later. Uh, it just goes to, uh, down uh, like uh, Groovy uh, in one, uh, Groovy 1. So it should be able to handle them better, but effectively it does not. Anyway, so as soon as categories are active or some other meta class stuff you do, as soon as you go the more non-static, non-Java way, uh, you're doomed with those optimizations. So these are very, very, very special, very, very fragile, uh, help you almost only in micro benchmarks. So it's nice to get near Java with those, but they are not that helpful actually, unless you want to impress a manager, which is nice, but not our goal actually. So we come to Invoke Dynamic <coughs> or Short Indie. I have been told I should say Invoke Dynamic and Indie because not all know that. <laughs> In, uh, if you look at the bytecode then, at the uh, reworked bytecode, it would more or less look like this. It's, it's not the exact version, but uh, you will notice uh, the code is much shorter now and you, in, you will notice Invoke Dynamic instructions all over. So it's a bit similar to the Groovy 1 version, only that instead of uh, a strange arrays and uh, a strange uh, script bytecode adapter stuff, there's no invoke dynamic. I didn't add the uh, bootstrap method, otherwise it would look bigger. It's just for your information, actually. The problem we have a lot with invoke dynamic is you still are able to replace, for example, plus and uh, the integer plus, of course, returns integer. Uh, but who says I replace integer plus with something that still returns integer? It can return double or long or a string or whatever. So I, I can, for example, for my Fibonacci, uh, I, I can uh, replace integer plus with something that does the two string of the arguments and returns that. And uh, well, it will fail in the end because <coughs> the int unbox uh, cannot handle uh, strings. But you could do crazy things like that. It's, it's, it's not easy to verify what is actually allowed and where I can, what I can do. It could also be that the uh, uh, the plus is, for example, uh, doing uh, only a bit as a return. For example, uh, take the, 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 the first bit of the sum of the integers or something like that. Then you still have your int unbox, uh, you return a byte or whatever, or a double. You can, got, you can do uh, 
a long version here, whatever. It would work, but it's not nice. But who cares about what is nice? Your users are not nice. Uh, if you give them something they can do, they will do at one point, and you have to handle it somehow. So either you don't allow them uh, up front, or you have to do something with what they produce. Of course, compared to the primitive optimizations, we have a lot of object in here now. A lot of object means a lot of boxing. So in the primitive optimization path, in the fast path only, we had zero additionally needed boxing, unboxing actions. With our cost, custom call site caching, we had an array for each method call, which means uh, additionally to the boxing, of course, you need to produce the array, the object array for the arguments, which is bad by itself already, but we concentrate on boxing here. So to do the minus operation, you had two boxing actions. And of course, the minus you call is the, the uh, int minus. So in the end, you do the boxing only to unbox the arguments again, uh, to do the operation. And then the result is boxed again, because uh, your call site caching is returning an object as well. And similar situation uh, with plus. Only in our Fibonacci example, the plus is uh, working on the results of the Fibonacci call. The Fibonacci call will have the unfortunate boxing already done. So the plus call saves uh, two boxing actions. But still you have to do two times unboxing, one, uh, one boxing. And for the Fibonacci call, it did take a primitive int. So you, you, the minus operation results in an object thing, you, so you have to uh, unbox to do the actual call. And when you return, you box again. <coughs> in total, this sums up to nine times boxing and nine times unboxing per Fibonacci call. Uh, invoke dynamic can help here a bit. Invoke dynamic helps you uh, doing the method invocation without that stupid uh, object array. Um, you can do it with the primitives directly. But of course we have the problem with having to return an object, so we still have some unnecessary boxing, unboxing in there. For the minus case we were operating on primitives, so no additional boxing for going to the primitive but uh, since we have to return from the primitive and it's returning object, since we don't know if it will stay in int, we have one boxing action for the minus. The Fibonacci call is done with a primitive, but it gets results of the minus. So we're working on objects. So we have to do unboxing. And since we don't know if the Fibonacci call has been replaced, uh, we have to do boxing again. In total, this time, five times boxing, four times unboxing, which is a lot better than the call side caching version, but still enough to uh, drive the hotspot crazy in some times. If you do an implementation with Invoke Dynamic, uh, you usually don't just invoke the method you unreflected or got uh, found somewhere. Uh, you usually have some guards. And for Groovy, we have, for example, a guard for categories. Uh, if you use a category method, a method from a category, we have to check the category is still active or not replaced or other things like that. So uh, there is a check for this in there. Um, Actually, you can have a category active in one thread and uh, call the same call site from another thread. And there could be also category active, but they don't have to be the same categories. Uh, it's, so it's, uh, you may not have left or entered the category, so you need this thread check somehow. Which is not nice, but uh, actually not that expensive, as we found out in Invoke Dynamic. Then we have some checks about the meta class. 
uh, if it's our favorite meta class or expando meta class, for example, or if it's some uh, bad ugly custom thing that we can't say anything at all about and have to go through the meta class invocation path, which is again the, a slow path, but we can reduce the uh, number of checks we have to do for the uh, for the good cases, including expando meta class, and it helps a lot. We use a switch point for uh, changes on the meta class of Java classes. Um, Groovy has, um, unlike other many other languages, uh, per instance meta classes on uh, Groovy objects, um, and also has per class meta classes um, the, that are only available. Uh, well, they are also available for Groovy objects, but um, they are mostly available for the Java classes. Um, in the current structure of how Groovy is done, I can create a meta class and uh, I cannot register if it has been set on my Groovy object or not. And this is bad. But for Java classes, I can do it. Uh, so at least for Java classes, I can use a switch point and, and do it a bit faster. Then, um, then there's uh, the cases of missing method exceptions, which I may have to uh, catch to go in our MOP. Very bad decision to use uh, checked exception, uh, sorry, runtime exceptions uh, for control flow. Uh, back then it made sense. Now it's very ugly. Bad decision. What can you do? Then uh, there are runtime exceptions, which are working as wrappers uh, for checked exceptions mostly. Uh, that's because most of the Groovy runtime is still written in Java. We will change that over time. Uh, Groovy does not check its exceptions at all, but uh, Java does. And if you throw a checked exception somewhere in there and you have to transport it outside, you have to wrap it usually in a, in a runtime exception. There are other ways actually, but we didn't know about them. So um, often you have to check that the argument or receiver is of the same class as before. Though um, in uh, the current implementation of Groovy 2.01, uh, this is uh, done more than needed and needs a bit to be changed. We have special class conversions. We have a Groovy string that is called gstring. Uh, it's a modifiable string. gstring is for Groovy string. Always get some loss. Um, and uh, it's a kind of su uh, subclass of string uh, or equal to it, but not just the same, which is real fun to implement sometimes. Um, but it works mostly now. And we also have uh, widening conversions for big integers and big decimals. So uh, you what you can do in Groovy, for example, you can assign a double to an integer, or you can assign an in a big decimal to an integer, for example. Uh, Groovy will not complain even if you lose precision, but um, the conversion has to be done. So for uh, my, my Fibonacci example, for the minus and plus operations, the only guard that was used was the switch point. Uh, because it's an operation on uh, integer. Integer is a Java class, so I need only to react to the meta class changes of the Java class, which I can do through the my switch point. For the Fibonacci method, it's a method on a groovy object. For the groovy object, I have to check uh, the meta class. So I have to have the meta class check. I have to have the switch point check in there, because it is also triggered for category changes. Then. I have some same class checks in there, which, we, as I said, has to be reworked. So a lot of, a lot more guards. So the advantages of uh, doing invoke dynamic for us mostly is that you get a lot better readable bytecode and a lot shorter bytecode. The cost are caching bytecode you can really not read. That's uh, if you look at the bytecode, it's not only big; it's the names don't I even appear. So uh, if you have to pick a byte, uh, if you have to fix a bytecode bug. I have lots of fun, I can promise you. Then, uh, of course, Invoke Dynamic provides some nice optimizations. And uh, the method handles API is really, really flexible, uh, which is very nice to do some composing and all. Though, if you compose too much, uh, it will not be optimized anymore. 
And uh, sometimes the IP API requires some reverse way thinking uh, uh, compared to reflection where you usually work from the arguments and here you work from your method. That gets a bit uh, brain damage to me sometimes, but I survive. And of course, the ugliest thing of all that Invoke Dynamic cannot solve, you have this black box, black box hotspot. Uh, that may uh, behave reproducible, but you make a change and you will not exactly know if that change is good or bad, especially uh, combined with uh, three, four other changes. So it can be, you do a small change and it's a little better. You do another small change, it's a little bit better. You do another change and it's much worse. And, um, okay, can happen. Or you do a small change and it's a bit better. You do another small change and it's a lot better. But not because of the other small change, but because of the combination of those changes. It's a bit difficult to predict, at least if, if you're not Remy uh, Farah, who knows so much about in, uh, the hotspot. There are problems we cannot solve with Invoke Dynamic. Um, calling superclass constructors. Groovy classes are real Java classes, so we have to be able to call supper somehow. Uh, doing an in, an dynamic invocation of supper is a bit difficult because it requires an invoke special instruction. Uh, it doesn't, you cannot do it with reflection. Uh, we prefer not to doing it with unsafe because we like to run on other JVMs as well, if possible. So we, we cannot do that as a default path at all. What we do then is some kind of, I go to my meta class and ask what kind of constructors are there and how many. Then I let it select uh, with an index after sorting them. And then I use this to switch over uh, a bunch of invoke special instructions to invoke my subclass constructor, <coughs> which is of course only needed if it's an overloaded subclass constructor. Um, but it happens a lot and it can break easily. Adding a new constructor or something may uh, break all up. We, need, we have some ideas now and uh, John made some suggestions how to improve that. And uh, of course, what would be nice to have in some, time, in some cases, uh, for example for this case, uh, you have to do transformations of your arguments maybe. Um, but the only way you can do is pack them in an object array, transform the, them inside and return that object array to unpack the object array later to do your invoke special method call. It would be nice if there would be a method handler that just uh, takes the arguments and then leaves the arguments on the stack again. But I guess that's impossible. I, I'm not sure that's really possible. And of course, the biggest problem uh, the optimizations done with method handles are, of course, only the ones uh, the uh, JVM engineers dare to look at and not what we thought of. So, to my last slide, uh, some numbers to compare the performance. The static version is uh, uh, it's a static compiled Groovy, which you can do with an annotation, which is new in Groovy too, but uh, it's, it's very similar to Java and allows only a subset of the language, so it's, it's not dynamic at all. You, you will see that the primitive optimizations version is about uh, half the speed of, uh, of the static version. Unless you activate in category, you are about 100 times lower. Um, terrible. Uh, with uh, Invoke Dynamic, on my machine at home at least, it was uh, uh, about three times uh, Java speed. Uh, on my laptop here, um, let's don't talk about it. <laughs> With core side caching, uh, you have been in uh, almost 10 times the speed, which is um, much better, uh, but because it's modified core side caching, I improved core side caching with some knowledge I gained from Invoke Dynamic. Uh, also, as soon as you activate a category, this breaks totally down. And the central invoker approach, you see here, uh, I don't know, 10 times lower than core side caching, um, also not nice. Um, and 
it had the same problem with the categories actually. The only one who can handle its categories well now is in invoke dynamic. And that's uh, because we don't have, we know if you check a method that comes from a category and don't have to do anything further. And then I have one uh, little wish list, and that's really my last slide. Uh, I would like John, if possible, to make this boxing elimination uh, work very nicely because we really cannot do very much about avoiding that. And there's this catch exception guard, which uh, has quite a drain on performance, which John almost already promised me to improve. I hope he can do it, really. Uh, very nice would be to have per call site, um, per code path call sites for, for internal iterators, for example, which are also uh, used a lot in, uh, in uh, Groovy. But uh, I think that would be also for lambda expressions uh, something to care about. Well, and uh, some predefined guard for classes, uh, for checking the same class, even though that's, that's really optional because I found it's very fast. So that's it for uh, further questions. Just come to me, just come to the workshop, for example. Thank you very much. <laughs>